Good. Well, good morning, family. Good morning. Good, morning. good to see all of you this wonderful morning. It's a great day. It's a, it's a better day knowing that I, I'm here now. And Natalie yeah. and I are here now for at least, well, for a couple of weeks, which is great. And then even then, it's just like a couple of days gone at a time instead of two weeks gone at a time or a week gone at a time. So I am excited. Hopefully you guys are excited. Uh, and especially we, we get a chance to get into God's word today. So any day that we get to do that, it's, it's a good day. I don't know if you noticed, but the, the seasons are changing. Have you, have you no. noticed that? No. I don't know, it's like, oh, okay, we can't talk about it. Bless me. Ah, cover my ears. But it, it, it's happening. The, it's getting a little bit colder outside. The, the geese are starting to fly away. I turned my heat on the other day, begrudgingly, I might add. <laughs> Natalie decided that 63 degrees is not like hospitable anymore. So I was like, okay, fair enough. I turned on the, turned on the heat. Uh, but, you know, although I, I, I sense that maybe some of you aren't looking forward exactly <laughs> to, the, to the change of season, there's still lots to look forward to. Lots of good things coming. The, the Alaskan fall is a really special time because it's, it's a time that we kind of come together and we kind of settle in, you know, get a little bit more refocused, We're settling in from all the craziness of summer, time to re-engage, kids are going back to school, the campus students are streaming back in over the next few days, and it's time for them to get back to their studies, and so the fall is really a time for us in Alaska to, to refocus, right? So much of our summers often are just filled with stuff. Right? And it's, it's good stuff, it's, it's fun stuff, but when we're doing all of the stuff, sometimes it's, it's hard to, or it's easy to, to, to lose focus, to kind of get scattered in our minds about all the things. It's easy to lose focus on the things that really matter. And so as we transition into the fall and as the seasons are changing into the fall, we too are gonna be moving on into kind of a, a change of season. We're gonna spend some time refocusing and re-engaging and we're going to be doing a new journey in the scriptures because last week Keith finished the book of Genesis if you're here with us and so it's time for us to move on to something new right we learned all about the beginning we learned all about where we come from and now we're, we're moving on and again in a way that's going to help us to get re-focused refocus and re-engaged in the most important story and the most important person in all of the Bible, which is Jesus. Jesus, of course. Getting back to Jesus this fall. And it's funny, you know, because we are a Christian church, in fact. We're a Christian church, and so our church is based on Jesus. It's based on Christ, and yet it's so easy to miss Jesus, isn't it? We miss him for a lot of reasons, and a lot of reasons that seem very legitimate, right? It, it reminds me of this past summer during uh, all of these Hope Youth Corps programs that Natalie and I were helping to run. You know, when, we, when you do a program like that, there's a lot of details to think about, right? There's the schedule, there's the food, there's the activities, making all the reservations for the fun stuff. There's the, the transport plans and arranging vehicles to make sure they're all in the right space. There's we've got to make sure that the bathroom is cleaned and the lodge is clean and the kitchen is ready. And we want to make sure that all the details, we've got to make sure that there's enough oversight for the people. We've got to make sure that everybody's staying safe while they're out here doing these volunteer programs. And so there's just a lot. There's a lot of these little details to make sure that we want to be ready. But among all of those tasks, it's so easy to forget the big picture. Right? And the big picture for the Hope Youth Corps program is to get a bunch of people, a bunch of kids up to volunteer and to connect with Jesus. Right? To get to know him, to connect to him, hopefully in a new and different way, to walk away with a new perspective about how Jesus made an impact on this world. And again, just new ways for them to connect to him. But it's so easy to get caught up in all the details, isn't it? To forget that bigger picture. And I think that we do this in all kinds of areas of our lives. We can get so easily caught up in work and school, relationships and families and all of this stuff. And all of these things are great. They're good. And in fact, they're spiritual. God wants us to have these things, right? Jesus wants us to have these things. 
But sometimes, again, in the midst of all those things, we, we can forget about him. Even though Jesus wants to work through them for his glory, even though Jesus wants to use them so that way we can be more effective for him, we forget about him in all of it often. And it's easy to do that. And we can even do that in our study of the scriptures. And when we're thinking about faith and we're thinking about the Bible, because in the Bible, there's so many great things, right? There's all of this information about how to build real, great, meaningful relationships with others. There's things that we can use to help us in our lives. We learn how to grow the church. We learn how to make an impact through service. But again, it's so easy to get caught up in all the specifics and practical applications and all the doctrines and evangelism methods and growth strategies that we forget. Jesus. And so we have to come back to, and we have to remember, even in, in the scriptures, that really what, are, what is the Bible all about from Old Testament to New Testament? It's about Jesus. And John 5 really makes this point pretty clear. And this is, this is John 5. This is Jesus talking. He's actually criticizing uh, the Pharisees at this particular point. And in verse, 30, verse 39, he says, You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. You ever find yourself doing that? Right? That we're, we're looking for these things. We're looking for truth and meaning and reality. And we forget that they're all about Jesus. We forget that he's in everything, right? Again, in the Bible, whether it's the Old Testament or the New Testament, you're reading about Jesus. When we read in Genesis over the, last, over the whole course of the summer, long before Jesus ever set for, for, long before he ever set foot on the earth, we were reading about his creation, a creation that was made by him and for him and through him. We learn about how we're made in his image, Right? And even early on, Genesis establishes our need for Jesus as it talks about the fall of mankind and the sin that separates us from God. It, again, highlights our need for Jesus. And so, again, Jesus is everywhere in the scriptures when we're looking for him. And he's everywhere because God and his spirit wanted us to see and understand that Jesus really does reign supreme. That Jesus really does have the supremacy in our world. And I think Paul, in the book of Colossians, really emphasizes this point wonderfully. Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 15, it says, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the body, the church. He, he's the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile himself all things, whether things on earth or by things or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. And I want us just for a moment to step back from this and really appreciate what this passage is saying about who Jesus is. Jesus is the visible image of our invisible God. He's the physical demonstration of who God is on this earth. Everything that we see, everything that we've, been, that we've experienced was made by him and through him and for him. He holds everything together. Everything is held together by Jesus. He's the head of our church. I'm not the leader of this church. He is. I'm hoping to, to guide us towards him. That's, that's kind of my role. But he's the head. We're looking to be his followers and continuing to pursue him. He's the beginning. He is the firstborn from among the dead. All of the fullness of God dwells in him. 
in Jesus. So all of the amazingness, all of the power, all of the might of God is in Christ. And he has reconciled his people to God. He has <coughs> supremacy over all. And even more amazing than all of this, that he wants all of this power, all of this might, all of this wonderful nature of God that's in him, he wants to live in us. And he wants to make his home in us by his spirit. And you know, we, we've probably heard this all before. We might know these concepts intellectually, but really when you think about it, these claims are staggering. The implication on our lives is incredible. This is amazing, tremendous implication on our lives. It's, his glory is truly mind-blowing when we take the time to think of it. He is so big. His love is beyond comprehension. And yet, do we stand in awe of Christ? Like, really, do we stand in awe of Jesus of who he is, of what he came to do. It's so hard because for many of us, we've heard about this stuff from day one of our lives. We've heard about it over and over again. And so it's so easy for it just simply to be cliche, yeah. something that we've heard before. It becomes normal to us because we've heard it so much. We become more and more hardened to his glory. But if we really, if we even partially understand, just even get a little glimpse of this glory and understand what it is, we should just be in awe of him. We should stand in awe of who Christ is. We should be moved to glorify and worship him. Philippians chapter 2 verse 9 says, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place. And gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. Do you really acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord of your life? Do you recognize and submit to his Supremacy. Over this fall, I really want us to be able to refocus on more than just the, the doctrine of the person of Jesus, but I really want us to fall in love with Jesus, even if it's falling in love all over again. I want us to all experience and remember how he can truly change us from the inside out. And so that's going to be our focus for the fall. To fall in love with Jesus, to get re-engaged with Jesus, and to remember who he truly is. And so to facilitate that, we're going to go back to one of the stories of Jesus. A gospel of Jesus. And in this case, we're going to be in the gospel of Luke for the fall. And so, whenever we, we get into a, a, new, a new book of the Bible, we have to take some time, step back a little bit. And we want to get a little bit of context in order to understand more about how and why the, the biblical author writes. And so in this case, we need to learn a little bit more about this guy, Luke. So tradition holds that Luke was the author of not one but two books of the Bible. He was the author of the Gospel of Luke, but also the book of Acts. And so Luke was a longtime traveling companion of Paul the Apostle. And so that gives him obviously a lot of material for his book of Acts. Um, and actually, many suggest that at one point in time, Luke and Acts were just one large kind of volume, except like these two letters that were kind of one piece, but then were later separated. And they really do go together quite well. And they say that he wrote these uh, books probably around 60-ish, the early 60s AD. And Luke was really interesting among the writers of the Bible and really... Of the, of the New Testament. For one, he was a Gentile. And so within the New Testament, he is the only confirmed Gentile that wrote a book of the Bible. And so he writes from a very different perspective than many of the others of the New Testament. Secondly, Luke was a doctor, and he was a historian. 
And so the, the, the Greek that he uses kind of points to the fact that he wrote to a more affluent uh, audience, uh, someone, a group that knew a little bit more, that was more wealthy perhaps. And so in many ways, the, those two combinations of coming from a Gentile perspective and Gentile background and the fact that he writes to a little bit of a more affluent audience really makes him a great gospel for reading in America. Because that's really most of our backgrounds. We tend to come from a Gentile background, and we tend to come from a little bit more wealth, especially relative to other countries in the world. And with that background, and that historical background, the historian aspect that he has, and that doctor aspect that he has, he tries, he tries to cram more into his gospel than any of the other gospels. His gospel is the most detailed of all of them. And in fact, Word for word, the book of Luke is the longest book of the whole New Testament because he's trying to cram in as much of the person of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, and, and the impact of Jesus into his book. But what was Luke's main purpose in writing the gospel? What, what did he really want? What, what, is, what was he really trying to get across? Well, he says so pretty clearly in Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 1. He makes his purpose clear. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those from the first, who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too have decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. So what was Luke's main purpose? He wanted his readers to be sure. He wanted his readers to be certain about this man, Jesus, his life, his teaching, and his impact. And the intended recipient here that's mentioned, Theophilus, he might have been a real person, a very specific individual that, that Luke wanted to write his letter to, but the meaning, the Greek meaning of the word Theophilus, or the name Theophilus, is friend of God or lover of God. So even if Theophilus wasn't a real specific individual, you can see here that the book of Luke was written to anyone that wants to have that sort of relationship with God, who wants to love him, pursue him, who wants to have friendship with Christ. Anyone who wants to have that certainty of who Christ is and what he came for. And so again, that makes it a very good book for all of us to be able to go through, to learn more about Jesus. But the larger picture goes beyond just us and just our certainty and just our standing in awe of God. Because if you, again, if you put the Gospel of Luke right next to the book of Acts, you see a, a pretty specific trend. And that trend is the story of this one man, Jesus, a Jew, who changed the course of history, who started a movement that started in the Jewish world of Jerusalem, but then spread everywhere. It spread outside of Judaism, and it extended God's grace, his mercy, and his kindness, yes, even to the Gentiles. And this is a big deal, because in this time when Luke was writing, it was still commonly held that the relationship, a relationship with the one true God, was a very specifically Jewish concept. The Jews were the only special people that could have this sort of relationship with God. But Luke shows how it's shared. Luke shows how it can go and, and go to the ends of the earth and impact even the Gentiles. And so this is, this is more than just Jesus' story. This is our story. This is how we get to know Christ, how we get to know God. And again, this story was one that was meant to be shared. We talked a little bit earlier about being in awe of God and really seeing how amazing he is and recognizing his supremacy and lordship and seeing him at the center of our lives and the center of all of the elements of our lives. But it doesn't just stop with us. We're called to share it, called to spread that word. And again, it's not just the command to follow. It's something that God wants us to want to do. And this reminds me of this 
this past week, and I had mentioned on many occasions that I had been helping run a singles retreat with Natalie down at the Gateway to the Arctic Camp. And I'll be honest, running a retreat like that is exhausting. It's so tiring. And again, all the details come into play, right? Making sure that all of these things are, are, are in the right spot, right? There's tons of driving everywhere, trying to keep folks on schedule, getting them to their places at the right times, getting things prepared, making the reservations, buying the fishing licenses, preparing fishing poles, going on the hikes themselves, and all of this other stuff. And at times I felt like I was just like a chicken with my head cut off, just running around aimlessly trying to get things done. I'm sure you can relate in some way, shape, or form. But you know what? I loved it. And I always love it. Why? Well, because I'm sharing something that's really meaningful to me. I get to share this beautiful state of Alaska with others, with people that haven't had the opportunity to experience what I've experienced, to see what I ex have experienced here. And so I love showing people the mountains. And so I'm willing to go on the long, tiring hikes with them. And I love hiking, so I love sharing that with people. I'm okay with driving people all over the state, even though it's in this really ridiculously <laughs> slow bus, and it's not a fun bus to drive. But I'm willing to do that because I can, I'm helping people experience something awesome, something that I think is so great. I'm willing to spend hours untangling fishing line. <laughs> because I know how cool it is for these people to be able to catch their first fish, <laughs> which is so great. It's so much fun. <laughs> or to have that experience of completing a 19-mile hike. It's so awesome. And I want to share that with people. That's the same attitude that Christ wants us to have when it comes to our faith. And when we really do take that time to be in awe of him, to experience that glory, to to really connect and fall in love with him, it's hard not to want to share. It's hard not to want to talk about that with others. That spirit, that's, that's him in his people, it drives us to do that. And we see that here in, in Luke's version of the Great Commission. It's actually not in the book of Luke. It's in the beginning of Acts. In Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 8, it says, this is Jesus talking to, your, to his apostles it says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So again, you see it. It starts in Jerusalem, spreads to Judea, to Samaria, and then makes it to the ends of the earth. That was the plan from the beginning. Was it for it to start in a place, but then to spread? And here we are, 2,000 years later, about 6,000 miles away from Jerusalem, there's still work to do. We still need to hear and spread this gospel. There are still people that are desperately looking for what you have found, desperately wanting to know what you know, to experience what you have experienced in Christ. Does your awe of Christ drive you to share him with others? drive you to want others to know him? Will you go to the ends of the earth for him? Or even to the corners of Fairbanks <laughs> right here? So we're embarking on a new journey. One that will hopefully help us to fall more deeply in love with Christ and will challenge us to continually go after him and to be changed by him, continue to be changed more and more into his likeness, and to continue to be changed into people that share his message with those around us. And as we close this morning, we talk a little bit about communion. I want to share more of a passage that we already looked at this morning. This, this passage reminds me of, again, why Jesus is Lord and why Jesus has the supremacy and even why we have the opportunity <coughs> to be in relationship with him. So we covered Colossians 1, 15 through 20. We're going to keep going in verse 21 now through 23. It says, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you have heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, 
have become a servant. Why is Jesus Lord? Because he brought us back to God. He extended to us the possibility of salvation. We have an opportunity to be reconciled to God through Christ's death on a cross. A cross cross that he didn't deserve, a death that he didn't deserve, a death that he didn't have to allow, but one that he chose to allow so that you could know him, so that I could know him, so that you and I, despite all of our perfections and all of our sin, could be presented before God blameless, without blemish, free from accusation. That's what Jesus died for. And so each Sunday we conclude with communion to remember, to reflect on that sacrifice, to remember what he really did for us on that cross. And it's a time to get refocused on Christ for the week ahead, to be amazed by him again this week, to to be ready to share his sacrificial love with those around us. So in a moment, we are going to pass the trays that contain the bread and juice that represent Jesus' body and blood that was shed for us on the cross. So I want you to take this time to be in awe. Allow yourself to experience the wonder of Christ, to be amazed all over again by his love, by his sacrifice, and let that awe and that wonder and that amazement drive you this week to spread Christ's love to the ends of the earth. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord God, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your son. Thank you for Jesus. That we have an opportunity to get to know him. That we have the opportunity to stand in awe of him. To to understand just even a little bit of how awesome he is. God, I pray that you help us to see it. Help us to be in awe. Help us to be in wonder. Help us to be amazed by how great you are how great Jesus is. Lord, and I pray that that drives us and that moves us to, to appreciate what he's done for us, especially on the cross. Thank you, God, for sending your son to die on a cross for us, to, to make the ultimate sacrifice so that we could live, so that we could have a relationship with you. Lord, and I pray that that gratitude, again, it drives us to share that message, to get that word out so that other people can experience what we've experienced through you. That people can hear more about your wonder and your glory. And that in all things, God, that we are learning more and more to give you that glory. To help others give you that glory that you deserve. God, we love you so much. Again, we're so grateful for who you are and all that you do for us. It's in your son's name, Jesus, that we pray all of these things. Amen. Amen.